Hello, and welcome to our first online lecture for world history. This is how it's going to work. You should have picked up a worksheet labeled Lecture 1 from the table when you walked in. Anytime that there's a new lecture or activity that will be talked about or used in this class, you'll find it on that table ready for you to pick up when you get there. This particular one is called Lecture 1. The blanks that are on Lecture 1 will correspond to the information that you will find on the notes and information I'm going to present here. There are times where I might add information that is not mentioned in the presentation or in the notes. You are still responsible for knowing it. Please make sure that you are taking the time to listen to the lecture, not simply just writing it down. There's a lot of other valuable information that I talk about, but not listed. Additionally, please make sure you put away all the distractions. This would include your cell phones or uh, smartphones, Xbox, PlayStation, television, MP3 player, whatever. Put this stuff away. These things will slow you down and prevent you from getting all the information. Also, I encourage you to use the pause button if you need to. At the end of every slide, I try to put in on an automatic pause so that you can get all the information down that was on the slide. But if I forget to add one, please feel free to use that pause button. Finally, if there was anything you missed or didn't understand from the lecture, please feel free to review it again or simply ask me. That's what I'm here for. So now that we got all this basic information down, let's get started on our first lecture, which we will be talking about where humans came from, how they moved around, and the beginning of agriculture. So let's get started. We always start out a new lecture with a part that I call setting the stage. This simply is giving us a little bit of background information prior to getting into the details of the notes. Today, we are going to look at a few terms and definitions as we set the stage. So, setting the stage, we are looking at the answer to one simple question. Who are we? Well, maybe that isn't such an easy question after all. Maybe we have to put some perspective into it or ask some follow-up questions like, where did we as humans come from? Okay, there's a lot of information, a lot of way to, to understand or question that those three words. Who are we? So let's take a look at what we've come up with in setting the stage, giving us a little background. Evidence suggests that we as humans could be much older than originally had been thought. Or in order, in order for us to find out this information, about the past, scientists use artifacts to search for clues in order to answer these questions. Artifacts simply are uh, human-made objects, like tools and jewelry, that help us better understand the people that used them. Using artifacts helps scientists understand how people lived a long time ago. Whether or not they used forks or spoons, had dolls, what kinds of weapons that were used. All these things help tell us what life might have been like back in the day. Back in the earliest, uh, in earliest human times, there was real no type of documentation of writing things down of what life might have been like. This was the period of time known as prehistory. This general term typically leaves more questions than it answers. Simply put, prehistory is the time before the invention of writing. Because of the lack of writing, archaeologists, who are those people that study the past, use artifacts to get an idea of what it might have been like to live millions of years ago. The important thing to know about studying the past is that the story is not complete and there are many questions yet to still be answered. Now when we look into the beginning of history of humans, there are two prevailing ideas. The first idea is that of creation, that some higher power had put humans here on earth. 
The second theory is evolution, or that the theory that humans evolved or developed from other beings over a long period of time. I'm not here to tell you which one is right or which one is wrong. What I am here to do is to tell you what science has found and been able to discover based upon artifacts and other known facts. Whether you believe in creationism or evolutionism, I'm really not the person to ask in that regard or much less talk about. I will simply just tell you the different beliefs of evolution and the different beliefs of creation and let you decide for yourself. So, with that in mind, scientists have found some very interesting evidence in Africa. Anthropologists, who are people who study culture, and paleontologists, who are people that study fossils, attempt to use artifacts and fossils to understand early human culture. Culture is, a, is simply a people's way of life, or their unique way of life. How the way that, how the way that they live differs from others. These differences usually are in their values, attitudes, beliefs, and customs. Together, these four intricate pieces make up a person's or a group's culture. So, let's talk about Lucy. Lucy? Who's Lucy? Well, now that we have some background information, let's look at what scientists have found. In, seven, in 1974, scientists made a remarkable find in e Ethiopia. They came across an almost complete skeleton, and her name was Lucy. What made this remarkable find was that it was an unusually complete skeleton of a female hominid. Hominid refers to a being that was able to walk upright on two legs. So whenever you hear that word hominid, think of something, some human type being that walks on two legs. The discovery was made by Donald Johansson and his team in 1974 in Africa. This skeleton was named Lucy after the Beatles song Lucy in the Sky with Diamonds. This skeleton was dated to be about three and a half million years old. That means that whomever this female was, she was able to walk upright on two legs three and a half million years ago. This was a major find. Class, meet Lucy, or at least what's left of her when they found her. They were able to determine it was female based upon her pelvis bones that were found, or the, the remains of her pelvis bones uh, that were found. Simply her pelvis bones or her hip bones. Uh, men and women ha tend to have different size and, and density of hip bones uh, than one another, so that's how they were kind of able to determine that Lucy, or this artifact, was actually female. Another amazing find was that was not terribly far from Lucy was a set of ancient footprints known as the, the Letoli footprints. What makes a set of footprints interesting is that they were made of two hominids and that they have been preserved in volcanic ash in the area of present-day Tanzania, Africa, the central part of Africa, or cent central uh, eastern part of Africa. This discovery was made by an anthropologist, Mary Leakey, in 1978. Now, why should we care about a bunch of footprints, you ask? Well, these footprints were dated to be about 3.6 million years old. To visualize, that's 3,600,000 years ago. Okay, that's a big number. For And for the record, Christians believe that humans have only been around for 6,000 years, according to Jane, or Archbishop James Usher uh, in 1658 and Dr. Floyd Nolan 
James in 1996. So the religion is certainly a lot different than what science has told us. And if you look really closely, you can see that this image here is actually a Google picture um, that they put up on the Google site recognizing this find by Mary Leakey in 1978. You can actually kind of see the word Google in that picture if you look really close, for those of you that are paying attention. Here's a uh, scaled cast or a mold of the Laetoli footprints. Based upon the evidence, these hominids were bipedal, which means they walked on two legs. There is also evidence that suggests that one of the two pairs had stopped, turned around briefly to look behind before continuing on walking. What they were looking at is uncertain, but it does create more questions. Neither Lucy nor the Laetoli footprints uh, were made by what we consider humans today. Other such beings, such as Cro-Magnons, Homo erectus, and Neanderthals, were, walked the earth before we did. DNA evidence collected concludes that there's no link between any of these beings to each other. There's kind of a missing link. The closest example I can think of on how they might relate to one another as hominids is that they could be considered a separate species from one another. Similar in many characteristics, but different. Similar because uh, between the difference it's like a difference between a robin and an eagle. Both can fly, but they are certainly not nearly the same kind of bird. You can kind of put that in a similar perspective with uh, Cro-Mangons, Homo erectus, and Neanderthals. They might have looked similar, but they're really not. So now that we've seen about how hominids first appeared on Earth, now we're going to go into where they came from and where they ended up. From this map, you can see where the continent these hominids started. Well, if you trace these arrows backwards, you can see the area was Central Africa. The dates on these maps don't identify when hominids were there, but it shows the time when they started to leave. Here we notice that hominids started leaving Central Africa about 150,000 and 100,000 years ago, somewhere in there. This was done based upon the artifacts that scientists have found in different areas around the region and around the world. And from that, we can get an idea of when they showed up in different areas around the globe. So let's look at where humans have migrated to and what we can learn from it. Humans, such as ourselves, are known as Homo sapiens, which means wise men. Due to the brain size and how it compares to other hominids, basically it means our brains were bigger than those other hominids that have been seen. Eventually, Homo erectus, which is another type of hominid, and Homo sapiens migrated out of Africa. Early on, humans were nomads, or highly mobile people, who moved from place to place, forging for new sources of food. We also know that early humans were hunter-gatherers. Hunter-gatherers are simply those people whose food supply depended upon them hunting animals and collecting plant foods. As I mentioned in the last slide, it's estimated that these groups started leaving Africa around 125,000 years ago, even though, also as I mentioned before, humans have been around, according to science, three and a half million years ago. So for that long time frame, they kind of stayed in the same place up until 125,000 years ago. As far as we can tell, humans began settling Europe around 33,000 years ago, China around 67,000 years ago, Australia 38,000 years, and North America around 12,000 years ago. South America between 12 and 33,000 years ago. 
Some of these time frames vary based upon known archaeological fa facts and assumptions. So there's obviously nobody really there. There's no hard evidence uh, of documents to show that they were there. This is just based on what archaeologists have found with uh, their evidence uh, while researching. Another way that we know these dates uh, is due to similar stone tool artifacts found in different regions that date to roughly the same time period. Geologists uh, have found the age of rocks and based upon the age of rocks they can deduce when they were used as tools. Finding uh, of these tools shows that early humans used technology to meet their needs. Keep in mind technology simply means the applying of knowledge uh, and tools and inventions to meet their needs. What we call technology today is much different than the technology back then. Using new types of things to create jobs to get a job done, to create items to get a job done. That's kind of what technology is. So back then an arrowhead is a type of technology. Creating a spear or a spoon or a hammer, those are tools, or a, a technology tools that these people would have developed. So technology today means much different, there's something much different than what it, we call it or consider it from back then. So you may be asking yourself, why did they leave Africa? Well, if everyone is living in the same place, there's going to be competition with other humans for food, room, and other resources. They would likely have followed the animal herds. Remember, these people were hunter-gatherers. They go where the food is. If the food moves, so do they. And simply, people left Africa because of human curiosity. What's over that hill? Let's go find out. Human curiosity can be attributed to many parts of human history, which we will be looking at in future unit levels uh, as we go forward. Instead of following the herds of animals, why not find a spot to call home and live off the land? Agriculture changes everything. Early nomads lived in bands of 25 to 70 people as best as we can tell. They worked together for mutual survival. Around 10,000 years ago though, during the Neolithic Revolution, people began the art of farming. Based upon some evidence, farming actually happened accidentally when some women scattered some seeds near a campsite and noticed that the crops growing there, or those crops growing there when they came back the following season. It is assumed that the women did this because it was accepted that it was the men who would do the most dangerous hunting, since they were typically more physical apt to do it, and the women would do the gathering. So the women would see these changes because they'd be gathering from the soil and from the earth, where the men, they're just more interested in shooting their deer or their elephant or whatever. Rising temperatures worldwide would also provide for longer growing seasons. This would also have allowed those who began planting food to allow their harvests to grow longer and create a better and useful crop. The longer the planting season, the better the crop. It didn't take them long to realize that farming produced more food than hunting or gathering and that they did not have to go far to do the farming. Now the nomads could stay in one place in one area and make enough food for everyone without having to do a lot of hunting. And here's just a cute little comic strip. I'm tired of hunting and gathering too, but nobody's invented the grocery store. Once the ability to farm and food had started taking root, more food provided for higher populations and thus more laborers. Now we start seeing an early population explosion. And this holds true today. In areas where food increases, we also see an increase in population. Due to labor and farming methods, permanent settlements began to develop. From here we see permanent settlements turn into villages, villages turn into cities, and cities turn into entire civilizations. 
once you reach a certain population, you can begin the specialization of skills. Now everybody doesn't need to farm because you've got enough farmers to feed more people than it takes to produce the food. Simply put, specialization is the development of skills in a specific kind of work other than farming. An example would be instead of farming, a person might make stone tools or help those that do do the farming. Originally, to come up with the land to plant, the people would use what we know as a slash and burn farming. The cutting down and burning of trees and foliage, allowing for the nutrients in the soil to develop. Obviously, back then, they probably didn't know anything about nutrients other than the fact that it was making their crops better. The next advancement was the use of the domestication or taming of animals. Think of it this way. Would you rather go hunting for your meat, or would you rather go under the back find a good cow in your fenced in area and kill it. Imagine the time saved and the fact that you can control all aspects of obtaining your food. Not only can you simply just produce your own fruits and vegetables from the field, now you can also tame your wild animals or tame your animals, keep them in a fenced in area and kill them for the meat and the protein. You've got the best world. You don't have to go anywhere in order to survive. You can do it all within a small area. Coming up next in our next lecture, eventually all of this farming and domestication advancements would lead up to the creation of the first civilization on earth in the region known as Mesopotamia. This first civilization would also be known as Sumar, which you can see on the bottom right hand of the screen here. There you have it. You've completed your first online lecture. If you missed something or are uncertain of something, please feel free to go back and review the materials if you need. I would also like to remind you that although we went through a lot of information here, your textbook has even more. This lecture was to give you an insight and highlight on some of the supporting details about the materials in the book. Please make sure and take the time to review or at least skim over the textbook to get additional information that I might not have talked about here. If you have any questions about the lecture or related materials, please feel free to contact me so we can get your questions answered quickly. And with that, I'm all done for this lecture and I look forward to seeing you in class again. Have a great day.